Hello, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm Bill Goldstein. I'm the program curator here at Roosevelt House, and I welcome you here on behalf of President Jennifer Rabb, who of Hunter College, who is not able to be here tonight, and also Harold Holzer, the Jonathan Stanton director of Roosevelt House, who also is unable to be here at this starting time. I think he will be joining us um, once we are underway. Uh, I also want to welcome Robert Dalek here, uh, one of the great <laughs> American historians. Uh, and not everyone gets a hand when their name is mentioned. So, um, uh, one of the great American historians and presidential biographers. I know I've read many of his books on John Kennedy, on Nixon and Kissinger, his two volumes on Lyndon Johnson, uh, and uh, also Franklin D. Roosevelt's <laughs> political life. So even his wife was surprised that I had read the whole thing. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I have. Um, so I'm very glad to welcome him here and also you. So we will uh, talk. Uh, Professor Dalek and I will have a conversation. Then we'll open it up to you. And then uh, I hope afterwards you'll join us uh, in the Four Freedoms Room on the main floor for a reception and book signing. And I'm sure uh, Professor Dalek will be happy to sign copies of his book for you. Uh, so, so let's begin. Uh, I, I was quite struck by the thing, by the thing you say at the very beginning of the book, which uh, one of the reasons, one of the impetuses uh, behind impetus I, impet I, um, <laughs> impetuses behind the book was that more than seventy years after Franklin Roosevelt's passing, he has become a remote figure to most Americans, and I think at least in this house, he is not a remote figure. <laughs> no. um, so I was wondering if you could say something about what led you to Franklin Roosevelt um, as, the as the subject for your biography after all the other presidents that you've been sure. reading about. Well, you know, Bill, <clears throat> there's an old saying that history is argument without end because the question people constantly ask me was, uh, why write another book about FDR? There's been so much written. But he was so much in my view from the start of my career because the first book I wrote was about William E. Dodd, who was his ambassador to Nazi Germany, and then I wrote a book about all his foreign policy. So when uh, Rick Cott from Viking came to me and asked if I'd be interested in doing a one-volume biography, I jumped at the chance, you see. And I found it so uh, interesting to go back through his career and look at what he accomplished. And now, now, in light of our so-called president, <laughs> that, that I'm finding that uh, there's such an extraordinary amount of interest that I'm seeing um, people about Franklin Roosevelt, and I think it has something to do, at a minimum, with the fact that we have a president who is so controversial. You know, polling began in 1935, and Franklin Roosevelt's approval rating never went below 50%. And this president, he never reaches 50%. It's unprecedented in the first year of his term but let me not talk about him. <laughs> <laughs> Roosevelt was extraordinary. He's one of the three great presidents of American history, along with George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. And he also had a wonderful sense of humor, you see, despite the struggles that he went through, because he spent so much of his life immobilized in a wheelchair. And... Uh, the story I love best is about him and Eleanor, that uh, Ben Cohen told this story, who was uh, on the uh, Brain Trust. And <clears throat> Cohen came in the Oval Office one day, and Roosevelt was chuckling. And Cohen said to Mr. President, would you mind sharing the joke with me? And Roosevelt said, all right, Ben, I'll tell you. Eleanor was just in here. She had been to her doctor this morning for her annual physical and when she came in, I said to her, so, Eleanor, what did the doctor have to say about that big ass of yours? And 
And she said, oh, Franklin, he had nothing at all to say about you. <laughs> so, <laughs> he, he did have a sense of humor, and of course, who can get through that job without having some kind of uh, perspective and sense of humor? And uh, I'll, I'll let you ask more questions because you know I could go on about a hundred things. And uh. well, but but to get back to I mean the the impetus for the book. I mean, so so your editor approached you with it. What were the questions? One that he thought might be answered, and what were the questions that you thought remained? either unanswered or had uh, deserved a new look in looking at a president who has been written about so much and who uh, still, in many people's lives, looms very large. I mean, I just wanted to say, I said to you just as we were coming out that my mother, um, who is now 95, keeps saying that she just can't believe, given the present political circumstances, that her first vote for president was for Franklin Roosevelt, and this is what her life has led her to. I mean, yeah. so... Um. <laughs> well, my, my answer to that question would be that um, <clears throat> I was intrigued by the fact that uh, there's been so much disillusionment with our politics and so much a controversy and uh, disputes, debates. And I thought it would be interesting to go back and look at someone who was a brilliantly effective politician. Because from the get-go, I mean, when we look back and see what he had to cope with, when he entered that office, the country was in terrible shape. And there was a sense that uh, democracy and free enterprise might collapse. And that, of course, you had fascism in Italy, Nazism in Germany, and uh, Stalin and, and uh, uh, communism in Russia, and they were all crowing about the fact that they were superior to the American political and economic system. And, of course, what Roosevelt did right off the bat was to give people hope. See, He gave those fireside chats. And the first fireside chat he gave was about the banking crisis. Now, he had a way with language that he wasn't going to call it a crisis. He wasn't going to talk about a malaise. Instead, he said, we'll have a bank holiday, you see, which was leading people to feel, gosh, things are getting better. And in fact, during his campaign, the initial song they used was Anchors Away, remembering his post as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. They changed it to Happy Days Are Here Again. And that resonated brilliantly with people. Also, what I think worked so effectively was the fact that people thought that he had recovered from his polio. And there are no surviving photographs that I know of demonstrating his disability. And so they saw him as a kind of metaphor for what was happening in the country. The country was collapsing, was in terrible shape, but he was a man who had suffered through uh, infantile paralysis, had been immobilized, paralyzed from the waist down, and he had reached the presidency. What an extraordinary achievement. And he's the one who can lead us back to the promised land, get us through this, and restore prosperity, you see. And so, you know, he, he, he is a president for all time in that sense, that because the country goes through so many ups and downs and so many feelings of, a despair at certain moments in our history. And it's well to look back on presidents who were so effective and so wise in the way in which they created a sense of rapport with people. What strikes me most is the extent to which he had a tie to a communication, a communication with the mass public. After he died, 
Somebody stopped Mrs. Roosevelt on the street and said to her, I miss the way your husband used to speak to me about my government. So, as his body was transported from Warm spring, uh, Springs back to a uh, Hyde Park, a man stood by the railway track sobbing. And somebody said to him, did you know the president? And he said, no, but he knew me. So, can you imagine anyone saying that about any politician now? So, so his ability to connect with the public was just I I extraordinary. And he pioneered the use of radio, you see. The way John Kennedy pioneered the use of television with live televised press conferences. So, and to give the devil his due, the way Trump has used this Twitter business, you see. And so uh, it, it takes a kind of inventiveness in reaching a, a mass audience, you see. Well, there are two questions, and one is, uh, if you could talk a little bit about, you make the argument in the book um, that it wasn't only things like polio um, that, or even Teddy Roosevelt's progressivism in his extended family uh, that led to uh, Franklin Roosevelt's or gave rise to Franklin Roosevelt's great political gifts. I mean, you make it very clear throughout that every job he had, everything he did um, was teaching him a lesson in political leadership. So if you could take us a little bit through your, your early pages, I mean, the, the first part of his life before the presidency, and to tell us how what he was doing made him into the president, the uniter, uh, the, yes. the, the, the great leader that he was and then yes. continued to be yes. through so many years. Well, there's no question that I think I, I agree with you that he schooled himself in the ways of American politics. And of course, he had as his model his cousin Theodore Roosevelt. And of course, he was intent on emulating him by becoming assistant secretary of the Navy, uh, running for and becoming governor of New York for two terms. Of course, he also ran for the vice presidency the way TR did, but he didn't uh, achieve that. But still, he was mindful of how extraordinarily popular Theodore Roosevelt had been, and that Roosevelt, TR, had taken a very divided country and unified it behind his uh, leadership by particularly appealing to the mass of the society, to the middle classes. See, the historian Richard Hofstetter once said, Theodore Roosevelt was the master therapist of the middle classes. See? And uh, uh, Roosevelt was intent on that too. What I find most striking to jump ahead to his presidency is that people have quarreled over the, the fact that uh, he didn't end the Depression. Now, it's true. The Depression was ended by industrial mobilization, you see. In fact, as late as 1940, there were some 10 million people who were still unemployed in this country. But his New Deal, I think, did something in the long run more important, which was to humanize the American industrial system, you see. I won't go through all those alphabet agencies <laughs> and all those programs like you know Social Security and the National Youth Administration. And, you know, one could tick them off. But uh, these resonated brilliantly with people. And what's also very interesting to me is that he did not, and there's been uh, lots of criticism about this, he was not very uh, attentive to black rights, to the needs of African Americans, and indeed he refused to support an anti-lynching law. But the irony is that by the end of his presidency, blacks had migrated from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. And the saying was, turn Lincoln's face to the wall. See? And that Roosevelt, but particularly, of course, also Eleanor, because she was so uh, uh, devoted to the idea of attending to the needs of minorities in the country. 
Jackson. So uh, it, it really was such a rich and extraordinary presidency. And the larger arc of things, there were two major things that I think he did. One was to humanize the American industrial system, and the second was to bring the country in foreign policy into the 20th century, the transformation from isolationism to internationalism. Just one other little anecdote. I had dinner five times with President Obama. He liked to talk to uh, presidential historians. And <laughs> for what it was worth, <laughs> I sat next to him twice at these dinners. Uh, there was never any small talk. He was very serious about everything. But at one dinner, uh, uh, the issue of his Affordable Care Act came up. And uh, uh, David Axelrod was there and was talking about the difficulty of administering this. And I said to him, David, I said, what you should take pride in and take satisfaction from is that you've taken another step forward in what FDR did in humanizing the American system of government and, and, and our society, because the Affordable Care Act is another step in that direction. And of course, Lyndon Johnson was so much in FDR's shadow and thought repeatedly, almost endlessly, about how Roosevelt would have approved of the many uh, great society laws that uh, he passed, you see. So, you know, when I get a little feeling down about current <laughs> events, I think about this history, and I say, you'll see a great president again, you see. I know for the moment, John Kennedy, when you look at the polls, they ask people who was the great president, and they put John Kennedy at the top because he's frozen in our minds at the age of 46, so young, so handsome. But of course, you can write on to the slate anything you want, you see. And so Kennedy becomes a kind of uh, heroic idol. Well, one of the interesting things about what you're saying now about Franklin Roosevelt as a, as a leader um, is, and you make clear in the book, uh, is that he was a, a partisan politician. I mean, he never uh, shied away from partisan politics, yet he was also able to sort of massage it well enough that that uh, he he crossed, if not the rabid Republican you know, party lines, but he he was the master of the overall political process, even as he was quite an ardent and even bellicose partisan politician. So what do you think was his gift at managing those two opposite sides of the political spectrum? One element of it, Bill, was that he would never say in public the ugly things that we hear from politicians these days about opponents. After the 1944 election, when he defeated Tom Dewey, the governor of New York. He said to somebody, I still think Dewey is a son of a bitch, you see. But he would never say that in public because he didn't want to uh, demean the office of the president. He didn't want to speak in ways that would agitate feelings of uh, uh, deepening the divide in the country. His objective was to take pride in the fact that he brought the country together, that he made it uh, a, a nation. And remember, when he came to office, the 1920s had been uh, uh, notable for the fact that the divide in the country was so bitter between the fundamentalists and the modernists. And remember, the uh, 1924 Democratic Convention, which took 103 ballots to finally nominate someone nobody ever remembers now, John W. Davis, you see. But uh, the, the country, when he took over, depression, division between the South and the North, the rural and the uh, urban centers, you see. And he brought into the, into the mainstream 
of American politics, Catholics, Jews, the immigrants of the last 50 or 60 years, you see, he made a huge difference in unifying the country and bringing these people into the, and he said when he made Joe Kennedy the uh, ambassador to Great Britain, he said, oh, I'd love to see the faces of those English aristocrats when this red-headed Irishman shows up at the court of St. James. He chuckled about that. He, he, of course, later he wasn't very happy with Joe yeah. Kennedy, <laughs> but uh, that's another story. <laughs> we, we, you mentioned earlier, I mean, that one of the things that drew you to Roosevelt was uh, a certain kind of disillusionment in contemporary politics, but obviously you began this book long before yes. Donald Trump was even a candidate uh, right. for, for the Republican nomination. So could you speak a little bit about the role that you think, the various roles you think that the presidents you'd written about before, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, uh, played in creating that sense of disillusion, and then what you think uh, it was like, or what it was like for you to go back to a president before right. the disillusion that you had already chronicled in, in your yeah. previous book? Well, <clears throat> there's no question that modern politics has created a sense of uh, almost despair about so much of what goes on in our country. And of course, it began with the frustration over the Korean War. When Harry Truman, uh, his approval rating went down to 32% because of the stalemate in Korea. The country felt better about Eisenhower. Remember the buttons people wore? I like Ike, you see. And there was a positive feeling about him. And Kennedy, of course, became uh, beloved, and especially after being assassinated. And Johnson, at first, benefited from this. And, of course, he benefited from running against Barry Goldwater in 1964 because he was able to win a, uh, a huge victory and then put across all those uh, great society uh, laws. But Vietnam. Vietnam created such a sense, I think, of uh, uh, frustration. How could the United States, the greatest military power in the world, have been defeated in these jungles of Vietnam. Johnson had been warned. He had been told, if you send 300,000 men into those jungles, you'll never hear from them again, you see. And of course, by 1968, and Johnson kept saying, there's light at the end of the tunnel. And some wit said, yes, sometimes the light at the end of the tunnel is from an onrushing train, you see. <laughs> and, uh, that's when, I think, frustration set in. And then, of course, with Nixon and Watergate, it created such a sense of, because presidents cannot govern if they don't enjoy the trust of the public. The day Richard Nixon at a press conference had to say, I am not a crook, was the day his presidency was largely over. See. And yet... Do you think that having, as a biographer of Johnson, Kennedy, and Nixon, do you look at them and say there's not only something about the presidency that changed, but something about the characters of these men and the character of Roosevelt that make them different presidents quite apart from political circumstances? Well, but what's so important is the change <coughs> in the media. The fact that we now have uh, the internet you have all these cable channels. We, we talked to President Obama about that a little bit. Uh, can you escape from this constant barrage of attention, this 24-7, and somebody asked him, can you go to Camp David? And uh, Mrs. Obama happened to be at this dinner, and she said, uh, he doesn't like going there. He's an urban guy, you see. <laughs> but it, it's really impossible to somehow escape from this constant barrage of uh, investigation and speculation. And, you know, R Roosevelt had it much better in that sense. There was radio, but he didn't have this uh, constant uh, harassment, so to speak. 
and uh, uh, and Kennedy was, of course, a world-class womanizer. Who would get away with that nowadays? So, so I think the, the somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong question. <laughs> but you see, I think that uh, uh, there's such a legacy now of what I think the country hungers for great leadership. It thirsts for someone who they can trust, see as being a credible spokesperson for the United States. So, and something will happen. Someone will come along, some younger person. I'm hopeful, you see. And, and hopefully, also, that it'll be a woman. Because <laughs> it's high time we had a woman as president of the United States. <laughs> well, you say, you say something at the beginning of the book um, that the system has been capable of, of identifying candidates for high office whose commitment to the nation, to the national interest, exceeded their flaws and ambition. I mean, so you're 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 talking about something that's uh, in, intrinsic or endemic to the American political system. That not every president is equal to the greatest. Um, no. So what what do you think are the sort of structural questions after having written about so many presidencies that are either impossible for, for presidents, including Roosevelt, who in some ways lost control at key po points of his yes. administration, as you, as you make clear. Are there structural inadequacies in the, the executive branch that make it impossible for a president to govern well, in some it, way? It, it's, well, it's not just the executive branch. It's the system of democracy that, you know, the country is so diverse. It has so many different uh, elements and interests and regions and uh, attitudes and religions and uh, how do you bring them under one tent? How do you bring them together? How do you, and if you uh, win a big election as Johnson did in 64, he knew that after about 15, 16 months it, it was going to disappear. That uh, and if you're there, and this is what I think undercut Hillary Clinton last time, it was Clinton fatigue. So when you're there for too long, it really uh, uh, disillusions people. It's you because everybody's flawed. All these politicians are flawed. They all have some degree of narcissism. Which <laughs> otherwise, why would they get into this business? <laughs> is my feeling. And so uh, their, their weaknesses end up being exposed. And, uh, uh, and, and so it makes it very difficult for them to sustain uh, a hold on the uh, mass public. No, no, nobody could uh, win four elections now. Not even forget the 22nd Amendment. Nobody could do that anymore. Now, of course, th the difference was that Roosevelt had uh, this uh, war that the country became involved in. So that was uh, a, a, a boon to uh, his success, I think. So one of the things you say about Roosevelt, though, that I, I was thought very interesting is you, you say much too much has been made by historians and critics of Roosevelt's inscrutability. I mean, the fact that yes. w w he's, he's so famous uh, for having said one thing to one person, agreed to everything that this person said, and then the next person coming into the office, he would agree with everything they said. And, and the veneer, the mask that he wore, uh, you say, is overemphasized. Yeah, and especially because I made uh, extensive use in the book of uh, the diaries of uh, Margaret Daisy Suckley. And he spoke to her in candid ways, I feel. And I think those diary entries of her were very revealing, you see. And you could see the real man. And after all, uh, when you look at his records and you look at how he worked and what he did, uh, it's not a total mystery. Yeah, I mean, he was political. And you know, and people like Huey Long would complain. I go to see him and he says, yes, yes. 
and then my opponent comes in and he tells him yes, yes. He says yes to everybody. And well, you know, there was method to his madness. But, uh, uh, and he also knew that he was dealing with people who needed to be stroked. And he, he was a master psychologist, you see. I've said, because I, I've taught university students for 50 years now, and I've said to them, nobody can teach you how to be a great politician. I think there is an intuitive quality to doing this. And uh, yeah, I mean, there are plenty of people who get into politics, but to be a truly great politician, I think there, there's something that goes beyond the ordinary. I don't know what it is. I couldn't do it, <laughs> but uh, some people have it. Well, wh another thing about Roosevelt that you uh, go into a great deal of depth about is his, his health, I mean, which has oh, been yes. uh, a, a long-standing historical controversy when his health started to fail. And I was struck by something you, sh you point out in 1942, early, I think, in 1942, he uh, begins, or you give the example of one particular press conference where all of the questions uh, that come to him, he has, he has to ask that they be repeated. And so you see this, he was 61 as a sign of his hearing loss and then other, other incapacities. Can you say something about what you learned and what you say about his, his health? What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, what I found was that <clears throat> beginning in 1940, I uh, have a very dear friend where we live in Washington, Jeff Kelman, who is a brilliant physician, and he helped me a great deal with my uh, Kennedy material when I was able to get into Kennedy's medical records. But I consulted Jeff about uh, Roosevelt's health. And in 1940, uh, some of you may know this, he was in his dining room at Hyde Park, uh, getting the returns from the 1940 election. And he said to his Secret Service agent, uh, close the door and don't let anyone in. And uh, the agent said, uh, not even Mrs. Roosevelt, he said, no one, I told you. See? And he was sweating profusely and seemed to be in pain. And subsequent to that, there were instances in which he would lie on the floor in agony see. And he already had, I believe, congestive heart failure, was suffering from that. And these were what they call angina attacks. See. And he lasted, of course, five more years, almost five more years, four and a half more years. But by the time he got to Yalta, he was really very ill. And Churchill's physician, Lord Moran, wrote in his diary, the president who saw him at Yalta, the president is suffering from hardening of the arteries of the brain. He'll be dead in three months' time. And he called it right on the mark. And so the question you know, that historians ask is, why, why did he run again? He knew he was pretty ill. I think if you put it into the context of the times, that <clears throat> so many people were dying in that war. 420,000 American troops lost their lives in that fighting. Maybe as many as 50, 55 million people died in that conflict. 25 million at least in Russia, millions in China, uh, in Japan, in, in the British Empire, in Germany, you see. And I think Roosevelt's attitude was that and he looked at the polls, and the polls said if the war was over, they didn't want him to run for a fourth term. But because the war was not over, he was going to win again. This is what he understood. But he said privately that if he weren't elected to the fourth term, his plan was to resign after a year and become the head of an international peace organization. This was his uh, ambition. Of course, he didn't live to uh, execute that, uh, play that out, but uh, uh, he knew he was uh, very ill. You know, when I wrote about Kennedy's illness, uh, 
because this was hidden from the public, and I managed to get into his health records, and my friend Kelman came with me to the Kennedy Library to go through the medical records because I'm not a physician and needed his help to also figure out what the medications were that he was taking. Anyway, uh, Ted Sorensen was very angry at me <laughs> for <laughs> revealing this, you see, because he was on a committee that controlled the access to Kennedy's medical records. And two of the other members of the committee, one was a professor at Yale and the other at Harvard, and they both agreed to let me in. But Sorensen was resisting, so I went to New York to meet with him. Now, I have been studying these politicians all these years for nothing. I talked him into letting me into the, <laughs> into the what medical. Did you, what did you tell him? What did you say to him? Oh, I don't want to report on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you seem willing to report on the secrets of others. But. Yes, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I told him that it was essential for us to know the full record of John Kennedy's history, and that, in fact, it would enhance Kennedy's standing. My friend Arthur Schlesinger, Ted Kennedy, they agreed with me. They were very supportive of that volume that I published, and they thought that uh, it, it really enhanced Kennedy's reputation rather than undermine it, you see. And in a sense, I think that's what should happen with this health record about FDR. We should remember him as being a man of great courage, a man who, in a sense, was willing to sacrifice himself for the country's well-being. After all, he won that fourth election by a very decent margin, you see. So the country was still very much behind him. Uh, he was really quite an extraordinary politician. And I don't know that we'll ever see anyone quite like him again, but hopefully there'll be somebody young in the wings uh, who will come forward and uh, lift the spirits of the country because we're going to go through some difficult times now, I think. Well, well, before we go to questions, I have one more question, which I, since you've uh, begun again to speak of his political mastery and what was so uh, uh, great about his own even sacrifice uh, to to the nation. Uh, can you say something about Lend-Lease? It seemed to me a perfect uh -huh. example of the way in which he uh, was aware of the international need but also domestic politics. And you yes. give a, a wonderful account of how it comes to be, and, and it seems to exemplify everything that you're saying yeah, yeah. about him. So if you could, yeah. if you could sure, say that sure. before we go to questions. Well, I mean, by uh, uh, December of 1940, after he won that second election, he announced that America should be the arsenal of democracy. And it, again, it was such an apt phrase, because people in this country were very much committed to the idea of helping Britain they wanted to see the British win the war. Uh, they were quite antagonistic to Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. And remember, this is even before Hitler had attacked the Soviet Union, which was June 22, 1941. In the end of 40, Roosevelt went on a, uh, a sea voyage. And it was very... Uh, helpful to him and relaxing, you see. And he came up there with the idea of Lend-Lease. And of course, there was a kind of, I don't know, double dealing here in the sense that what was really, what was Lend-Lease? The reporters asked him at a press conference and he said, well, you know, it's like this. If you have a neighbor and his house is on fire and he comes running to your garden fence and says, neighbor, neighbor, lend me your hose. Well, you want to lend him the hose because you don't want the fire to jump to your roof. You want to help him put it out. And if at the end of the fire, the end of the uh, uh, battle against that fire, the hose is destroyed, he'll replace it, give you the $15 to pay it back. 
or he'll give you the hose back. That's lend lease. And they said, what? <laughs> the point is, you mean those machine guns, the bullets, <laughs> the planes, <laughs> the whatever munitions we're going to give to the British? How are they going to give it back? They said they're broke. <laughs> Where is that $15 going to come from? But, you know, people didn't care because they wanted to help Great Britain. And so he would use this homey metaphor to describe how he was going to put this across. And then, of course, also when Germany attacked Russia and most of his military did not want him to give Lend-Lease help to the, uh, the Russians, Look what happened to the French, the, 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 the Dutch, uh, the, the Danes, that the German military machine will run over them. And Roosevelt said, no, Russia has a special ally. Really? What was that? It's called winter. <laughs> and he was convinced that if they held out till November, you see, this was going to uh, come to their aid. And again, you know, he guessed right. He was absolutely on the mark. He didn't always guess right about everything, but the really important things he guessed right about. So it's nice to be here at Roosevelt House. I feel his spirit in the air. <laughs> well, and Stalin right over your shoulder. Right? <laughs> 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 well, so thank you, Robert Dalek. We'll go to questions from the audience now. Thank you. <laughs> And we have we have a microphone coming around, please. Um, yes, Mr. Dalek, thank you very much for your talk. I'd love to take advantage of your incredible expertise. Uh, recent, uh, recently, there was a program here on the Vietnam War. Uh, Jeff Ward spoke about that, and Bill Vandenhuvel, a great uh, you probably know, a great Roosevelt scholar. And it came to the uh, the question came as to if, if Franklin Roosevelt was healthy in 1944, 1945, would there have been a Vietnam War because of his strong colonialism that he had, anti-colonialism? And would he have been able to impose upon de Gaulle and the French that they shouldn't go into the Vietnam War? And it, it, it's the consensus from Jeff Ward and from Bill Vanden Heuvel that it may have had a real effect where there may have not have been a, B, uh, a B, uh, Dien Bien Phu or a Vietnam War. And since yeah. you are so knowledgeable in all of these areas, I'd love to hear your opinion about that. Well, thank you. Um, I don't think it, it would have changed very much at all because Roosevelt despised de Gaulle. He was offended by him. He was uh, angry at France. They had collapsed so quickly that there was a sense that they did not deserve to be a great power at the end of the war. And he was reluctant to see them have a uh, occupation zone in Germany. But Churchill talked him into it because Churchill in essence said, we can't, we don't have the wherewithal, the resources to police Europe. We're going to need the help of the, of the French. Now, de Gaulle came to Roosevelt and there's a famous letter he wrote him about Vietnam because Roosevelt wanted these trusteeships, you see, that the United States and China would set up a trusteeship for Southeast Asia, and that at the end of 25 years, they would uh, become an independent, Vietnam would be an independent country, Cambodia, Laos, you see. But the Gaulle came to him and said, the communists will run riot if you don't let us get back into Southeast Asia, into Vietnam. And Roosevelt was mindful of the prospect of a Cold War. The evidence for this, I think, rests in the fact that in 1944 at the Quebec Conference, he and Churchill signed an aid memoir in which they agreed to hold back the secret of the atomic bomb from Stalin. Now, the Russians already knew we were building a bomb because they had some spies in the Manhattan Project, you see. But still, it speaks volumes about this idea that Roosevelt was so naive about the Soviets and about... Uh, he understood power politics. 
The Russians had moved into Eastern Europe. As George Kennan said, they had torn the guts out of the Nazi war machine, and they were dominant there, and we weren't going to war with them. Nobody in this country was going to stand up and say, oh, let's start fighting Russia at the end of this war, you see. And Roosevelt felt that this rising communist tide was a real danger, and that therefore the Gaul was coming back into power in France, and the French needed to get back in that Southeast Asian colony, you see. And so I think it would have been much the same and that they would have been there anyway. I'm wondering if you're overestimating a bit uh, Roosevelt's appeal to uh, in bringing the country together uh, among different ethnic groups. My Italian-American family told me, and, and tell uh -huh. me if this is correct, that in the early 40s he had plans to segregate and, um, if not in turn, some Italian-Americans similar to what had been done to the Japanese. Yep. And this was only thwarted because his friend G Generoso Pope, who was an uh, influential Italian-American, uh, objected. Uh, Roosevelt lost a lot, a lot of the, the growing and patriotic Italian-American population from that point on. Yep. Is that yep. correct? Well, I think largely that, that is true, that there was, uh, but remember, there was a lot of anti-Italian sentiment in the country because of Mussolini and the fascists and what they did in lining up with Hitler and the famous Roosevelt speech at Charlottesville, Virginia, when he said of Mussolini's declaration of war on France, he said, the hand that held the dagger plunged it into the back of its neighbor, you see. And this resonated with people, including many Italian-Americans who were antagonistic to, uh, and of course, they fought in World War II. What's so interesting to me is that this business of putting the Japanese into internment camps, part of it, again, had to do with domestic politics, I'm convinced, because the Japanese, after Pearl Harbor, were moving relentlessly across the uh, Pacific. And the United States lost Wake Island. It lost the Philippines. Uh, Burma was being threatened. And there was the sense that <coughs> the country needed some sense of hope, of, of, of uh, positive forward movement. And that Doolittle raid, you see, from aircraft carriers, and Roosevelt wouldn't tell them because the press asked him, how did those bombers get to Tokyo, you see? And he said, oh, they came out of Shangri-La, you see, which of course was this mythical place that was popular in literature in the 40s. But uh, uh, Roosevelt incarcerates the Japanese Americans. He tells his uh, secretary of war and those who are doing it, take responsibility, but, you know, he was giving approval to this. But it was a way of striking back at Japan. There were 120,000, 90 percent of them were citizens, of course, and Harold Dickies, Eleanor, were very unsympathetic to this, you see. But Roosevelt saw it, I believe, as a domestic political boost. The rage toward Japan in this country was just palpable. Indeed, if you look at the polling data, in 1945, when Americans were asked, what should we do about uh, Japanese war criminals? And people wanted to execute them, to inflict on them the most terrible kind of punishment, you see. And in 43, Roosevelt had the wisdom to let young Japanese American men form themselves into a military unit that fought brilliantly in Italy and won uh, all sorts of medals, accommodations, and uh, uh, so. But of course, it's one of the black marks that will never disappear.
and it was later said by the American Civil Liberties Union, it was the greatest violation of civil liberties in the country's history. Good evening. Thank you so much for a beautiful lecture. I enjoyed every moment of it. Thank you. I'm just wondering um, uh, if, if Roosevelt knew how sick he was towards the end, um, is there any conjecture about why he kept Harry Truman so in the dark? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> Truman really was quite extraordinary that he could stand in Franklin Roosevelt's shadow and emerge as he has now, in retrospect, he's seen as one of the great or near great presidents of American history, you see. But uh, Roosevelt, I think, uh, didn't accept the fact that his life was coming to an end. I think he thought, you know, he could make it through another year and there'd be time for him to uh, talk to Truman. But, you know, and it may have been that he was so ill that he didn't even have the energy to uh, consult with Truman. But it's too bad he didn't. But, you know, Truman was a shrewd politician in his own right because I've read the correspondence he sent to Churchill after uh, Roosevelt died and he became uh, president and he wrote Churchill... I know everything the president was thinking. He had me briefed. <laughs> it was all malarkey, of course. But I'm sure you know that wonderful story about how Truman was having drinks with Sam Rayburn and they called him. Oh, somebody came and said, you must come to the White House immediately and don't tell anybody. And so he took this tram or whatever it is that took him to the White House. And he comes in and Mrs. Roosevelt meets him and she says, Harry, the president is dead, and you're the president now. And Truman, showing his decency, said to her, Mrs. Roosevelt, is there anything I can do for you? And she replied, Harry, is there anything I can do for you? You're the one in trouble now. <laughs> we have time for a couple of more questions. Oh, Dorothy? Oh, oh wait. Uh, wait for the microphone. Well, you, you ask your question, and then Dorothy will ask her. See, everybody so. on my right side is getting the questions. <laughs> no, 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 here, just have him ask the question. A little further on the uh, the business of uh, sort of the way the Cold War started and our relations with the, the revolutionary forces in the, in the Far East. And we all know that under Roosevelt, the OSS maintained fairly close contact with both Mao and Yunnan and, and with Ho Chi Minh. Uh, there were OSS teams with both of them. So it would seem that he wasn't uh, betting on, on only one horse. Uh, he did stick with Chiang Kai-shek uh, because he thought that he had the, at least had the power in China, but he was certainly alive to the viability of, of the communists taking power. Now, Harry Truman yes. was an inveterate, small-town, knee-jerk anti-communist, and it is well known for the remark he made right at the, s the start of the war, which was ridiculous about let the Germans kill the Russians, let the Ger Russians kill the Germans, you know, to a country which wound up losing 30 million people. That was a hell of a thing to say. Uh, I cannot help but think Roosevelt would have taken a much more nuanced view of what our relations should be with these emerging uh, anti-colonial regimes, especially since he preserved an amazing amount of anti-colonialism in, in, in his own self, stemming, I'm, I'm sure, from his uh, yeah. old American stock revolutionary ancestors. Yeah. Well, Roosevelt, in <coughs> 1943, I think it was, sent as his ambassador to China a man named Patrick Hurley. And Patrick Hurley had been... Herbert Hoover's Secretary of War. He was a conservative Republican oil businessman from Oklahoma. He didn't know diddle about China. He wrote Chiang Kai-shek a letter, and he addressed him as, Dear Mr. Shek. <laughs> <laughs> and 
Was he? Was that man related to Shecky Green? By <laughs> any chance? I never thought of that. <laughs> but why did Roosevelt put him there? Because he was urging Hurley to try and get a coalition government, a compromise between the nationalists and the communists, you see. And that if it failed, it could be blamed on Hurley, the Republican who you see was so inept because Roosevelt told him to go ahead and do what he thought was best, you see. So he was always thinking ahead in politics. <laughs> and that's sort of... Uh, so what would have happened... Uh, you know, impossible to know, but he certainly was, I think, more flexible about these things. But remember also that the opinion in this country had become so violently anti-communist. There was such a powerful, uh, the, the UAC, uh, you know, the House of American Activities Committee, the internal uh, Senate Internal Affairs Committee, I mean, it would have been very difficult to run against this. And it brings me to the, the whole point also about the Holocaust, that you know, Roosevelt was felt tremendous pressure from the anti-immigration and anti-Semitic sentiments which were so pronounced in the country during World War II. And uh, he was uh, reluctant to... Go ahead. So, uh, well, I mean, we have to move on to other questions. We have time for two more questions. Please, please. I know. So let let's adjourn this to the reception. I mean, we, we've we've <laughs> spoken about this on many occasions. Here, we we don't have time for this. I mean, obviously, it's an important question. Uh, we'll talk afterwards. <laughs> two more questions. This, this man here, I'm sorry I've let this side go, um, <laughs> and then Dorothy. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I'm in the middle of this in really interesting documentary on New York City, the Ken Burns' brother, I don't remember his name, oh. and I'm right at the Roosevelt point in that. Okay. And they mentioned that he was at odds with LaGuardia, and I d they don't explain why, and I'd be very curious to understand what that was all about. Well, you should read my son's book, <laughs> 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 which is about uh, the origins of homeland security and uh, about Eleanor and LaGuardia, who were first appointed by Roosevelt to take care of civil defense, you see. And LaGuardia and Eleanor were clashing, were at each other's throats, you see. And I think it left a negative a feeling with Roosevelt about uh, the way in which LaGuardia had performed in response to dealing with this. He had been overbearing and too assertive and, uh, uh, and too militaristic. And Eleanor had pressed the idea that if you want to promote civil defense in this country, what you need to do is expand the New Deal, provide more in the way of social programs that's going to make people more devoted to the uh, national uh, ethos. Ah, this is the mother <laughs> of the author. <laughs> tell them, tell them. <laughs> Something under the night, yeah. <laughs> right? Well, you'll you'll just have to look up Dalek. Um, on, on, on his his name, name is Matthew. <laughs> so we have time for one more question, and then I hope you'll continue with the the questions and answers um, upstairs during the reception when uh, Professor Dalek will sign copies of his book. But so Arthur, thank you so. to both of you for a thank really you. really remarkable conversation. Thank it you. was really a privilege to be here. So I'd like to, for the last question, to bring us back to the beginning and your conversation about presidential leadership. You've written about so many. You talked about your times uh, with President Obama. Where does he fit on the Pantheon? Well, historians always take refuge in saying it's too soon. 
<laughs> Too soon to say. But, you know, obviously, he's going to be remembered as the first African-American president in the country's history. This was an extraordinary uh, development in the country's history. And uh, the fact that we've not had a woman as president, in a sense, deepens the feeling that what an extraordinary thing for him to have not just one, but one, two terms, you see. And, you know, he's uh, such a gentleman, and he's such a fine person, you see, and with fine values, and uh, it's just, it couldn't be more striking to me that the contrast between what is, I mean, it, it speaks volumes maybe about the schizophrenia in this country that on the one hand you have an Obama and then suddenly you have Donald Trump. And you know, I think Mayor Bloomberg had it absolutely right when he said, I know a con man when I see one. And the only thing I would say to the mayor is that he should have said, I know a con artist, you see. Because this guy is a con artist. But, you know, I did, I spent four years in training in the Southern California Psychoanalytic Institute. And so I have some, <laughs> some expertise. <laughs> and this guy is a malignant narcissist. And he's, he's a, a, a troubled man. And I'm frightened of his presidency. But I trust this Mueller, and I think he's going to bring forward some very powerful information. And, but we'll see. I'm not going to predict the future. <laughs> well, thank you, Professor Dalek. Thank you, Robert Dalek. Thank you all. Thank you. We'll see you upstairs.